Hey everyone, welcome! We are so glad that you are here. My name is Amanda Thomas. I will be your mistress of ceremonies this evening. And welcome to an intimate Science on Tap this evening. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, we are going to be talking about why poop is the golden ticket for killer whale research. And uh, that sentence has a lot of information in it that you may or may not realize quite yet. But our speaker this evening is Dr. Kim Parsons, who is in the, uh, I wrote this down, the lead molecular, or she leads the molecular genetics team in the conservation biology division at NOAA Fisheries in Seattle, and has a really cool job where she gets to help killer whale whales continue to, um, uh, continue to kill, yes. <laughs> I suppose, yeah, exactly. Um, so, how many of you, this is your first time, you're joining us for the first time this evening? Welcome. Um, we are, uh, Science on Tap is an event where we try and make science engaging and meaningful to folks, especially adults, which, um, you know, you would think using poop in the title might um, <laughs> appeal to kids, but also adults as well. Okay, so I would like to invite our speaker up here. Um, our speaker again is Dr. Kim Parsons. She's gonna talk to you, blow your minds for a little bit, and then I'm gonna come back up and ask some questions and bring the microphone out to all of you. So with that, let's invite our speaker onto the stage, Dr. Kim Parsons. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come down and speak this evening. Um, I appreciate everyone coming out, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit today about whales and poop and all that good stuff that maybe you didn't know before. Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Vancouver, BC. Um, did my undergraduate at the University of Victoria and then moved across to Scotland to do my PhD. Um, my area of expertise is whales and dolphins and genetics and all that kind of good stuff. And um, I currently, I, I've spent a lot of time working with various nonprofits, academics, and government organizations. Um, I currently lead a molecular genetics group at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington, which is one of the NOAA labs um, in Seattle. We actually have a couple there. And um, we're located quite close to the University of Washington. So uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in Canada. I was a budding marine biologist. I know the picture's a little fuzzy, it's kind of old. Um, this was my favorite t-shirt. This was like my favorite birthday. I think I was seven or eight, and my parents gave me like snorkel gear, this fun rainbow bathing suit, and a t-shirt that said water weasel. Um, and that was my nickname for a very long time because I would never get out of the water. Um, so I think that was forecasting things to come. And when I was little, I imagined what my life would be like as a marine biologist, and I imagine myself doing lots of boat work. Um, here on the left, I'm up in southeast Alaska on a, a harbor porpoise study. On the right, I spent a lot of time in the Bahamas. Um, I have a field uh, project down there that I've been working on since my PhD days, and that continues. A lot of time in the sun, which has its pros and cons. Um, but what I didn't imagine was how much time I would spend dealing with really slimy, smelly whale poop. As it turns out, it's been a huge benefit to research and to science and has given us all kinds of new avenues for studying cetaceans, so I wouldn't trade it for anything. Although sometimes my lab mates, they might feel otherwise. Okay, so um, the southern resident killer whales, as Amanda mentioned, um, are one of the local populations of killer whales. We actually have several different populations of killer whales that we encounter in Pacific Northwest waters. The southern residents are probably one of the, the better known populations. Um, they've been studied intensively and individually for a very long time, since the early 70s. And a lot of that work was initiated by a very good friend and mentor of mine, Ken Balcom, who started the Center for Whale Research on San Juan Island. Um, the, because of his work and the work of other colleagues in Canada, they, they pioneered this method for identifying individual killer whales based on their natural markings. So the same way that we can look at one another and recognize individuals by our faces, um, we can look at the killer whales and recognize individuals based on their natural patterns of pigmentation um, and, and uh, 
the shapes of their dorsal fins. Now, one of the things that we learned about southern resident killer whales by following them for many years and documenting individuals counting the number of whales in the population is that the population took a while to recover from some of the intensive removals that happened back in the early 50s and 60s when individuals were captured as part of the um, aquarium industry. And they were also shot at by, and targeted by fishermen in both Canada and the United States. So they had a bit of a hard time. But, you know, their numbers were recovering, and we were seeing great growth in the population up until the mid to late 1990s. Then at, at that time, right around, I think it was 96, um, 1996, the population started to decline. And we had a couple years where we had quite a few whales die. Um, and it sparked a lot of interest. And since then, the numbers have been declining. And this is unusual. Other populations were still growing. The northern resident killer whales are another resident killer whale population. Um, and they occur in waters of British Columbia. And, and they're kind of like, you know, the northern buddies of the southern resident killer whales. And their numbers were growing and the southern residents weren't. And so this sparked a lot of um, concern and interest and um, a lot of research to try and understand why the population wasn't recovering and what we could do to help support the recovery and, and, um, and uh, conservation of this population. So in 2005, the southern resident killer whales were listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. And that really leveraged um, a lot of additional support for the research. It made funding available so that we could um, conduct research and start to generate the kind of data that we needed to understand the population better. Now, when they did the review, and it was, a, it was an amazing team of scientists and both federal scientists and nonprofits and academics who reviewed all the data that we had in hand to try and understand the numbers, where the population came from, where it was going to, and how things looked, and what were the factors that were likely affecting the population. And they identified three primary threats, and that was um, the the presence of vessels, so that's anthropogenic effects, humans in their area creating noise and just boats in the way and things like that, um, the lack of prey, and toxic contaminants that were affecting their bodies. So these are really the three primary areas that we've been focusing on, as well as kind of spinning off of those and looking at other directions to try and understand more about the health of individuals. So this is kind of a really fun time to be a scientist, and I really like this slide because it talks about next gen, the next generation natural history. And there's all these really cool technological developments. We have drones, we have molecular genetics, we have really sensitive acoustic devices and remote recording devices, and, <clears throat> and all these things give us new tools in our toolbox as scientists to try and understand and study wildlife populations in a kind of hands-off way. So, you know, before we would have to catch animals and pull teeth and to age them and, and collect blood to get um, genetic information. And so now we have all these new tools, more sensitive tools, that allow us to study wildlife populations in a less invasive way. And so sometimes there's trade-offs, but there's also a lot of benefits. And this kind of um, the eDNA thing that Amanda mentioned, environmental DNA, that's kind of an area that I've spent a lot of time working in. Um, as a molecular geneticist, I use a variety of different samples. Sometimes those are skin samples, sometimes they're poop samples, sometimes they're water samples. And all those different um, samples give me opportunities to address different questions and study different species and, and also collect samples using one method where sometimes you can't with another. For example, um, when I was studying bottlenose dolphins in the Bahamas, we would collect biopsy samples, so they're tiny little pieces of skin that we would collect from the dolphins. However, if the dolphins are in a large group or you have a calf with a female, um, if they're resting and you don't want to disturb them, then we try not to disturb them and, and we leave them alone. But if you see poop, you can collect that because they don't pay any attention to that and they leave it behind. So it gives us an opportunity as scientists to kind of maximize our sample size, which is always something that we're striving for.
Okay, so clues from feces. Why is poop so interesting? <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, cheers. Okay, I'll try not to spill that on the laptop. <laughs> um, okay, why is poop so interesting? Well, you know, humans, wildlife, we're always using feces to study a variety of different um, aspects of the body, the physiology, the endocrinology, and it's, it's an amazing um, biological matrix. We can look at the individual identity, we can look at the sex of a person, we can look at their diet, their um, immune health, their gut microbiome. There was a really cool um, article that came across my newsfeed today talking about the gut-brain um, connection and how your gut microbiome can play a role in whether or not you enjoy or how much you enjoy exercise. So that was interesting. So there's all kinds of things we can learn from feces. And Amanda found this picture too. I love this picture. When it popped up, I was like, that's hilarious to me that my job popped up in the science magazine. <laughs> um, we don't collect whale poop like this. <laughs> we don't get underneath them. <laughs> um, we're just looking for what they leave behind. And, and um, it's you know, a lot less invasive. We're usually some ways back on a boat collecting it with a, a pool net on a long extendable pole. But the ability to collect whale poop, there you go, some of it on a, on a piece of sterile gauze there, has opened up all kinds of avenues for us, particularly for studying species and populations where we're trying to minimize our impact as researchers. And so the southern resident killer whales are an ideal example. So I mentioned eDNA and um, dietary DNA and fecal DNA and all these things give us, are, are available to us to study because we have these molecular genetic tools. And recently, um, in the last 10, 20 years, there's been like this huge democratization of sequencing. And so generating genetic sequence data from samples that are collected from wildlife, not just from humans, um, is much more available to us now. The technology has come along, the price has dropped, and now these things that were previously only used for sequencing the human genome, we're now using regularly in our lab for wildlife um, and other species, which is really amazing. So molecular scatology, if you like, it allows us to look at the kind of who, what, and where of all these samples. So we can identify the individual whale, we can look at what they're eating, we can look at where they were. All those samples are linked to a particular time and place. Um, and all that information, that metadata that goes along with every sample is really valuable and powerful and creates this wonderful database for us to query um, in a variety of different ways. Okay, so how does this work? So here's your, your genetics 101 primer. Um, so we get a poop sample from a whale, and then we extract the DNA, which basically means we take some of that poop, we mix it up with a bunch of surfactants and enzymes and break up all the cells, um, and then we sequence the DNA for the, the markers that we're interested in. And so we generate the sequence, which is that like ACTCTG. That's the, the DNA sequence for the region that we're interested in. Now with the southern resident killer whales, we've been biopsying them in the past, we don't any longer, but those biopsy samples are absolutely critical. What they allowed us to do was to collect a skin sample from a known individual whale and sequence it, and then we basically created a reference library. So we have our reference library of each individual whale in the population. Because unlike skin samples, fecal samples are usually collected behind groups of whales. So there could be one whale, generally there's not, usually it's a small group of two, anywhere to 20 individuals. And so in order to tag that information and link it back to an individual whale, we have to sequence it and then compare it to our reference library. So here's our reference library for a few different individual whales. And those little letters that I colored in red there, those are what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. SNPs is way easier. So those SNPs are the important parts because those are the, the bases, the, the parts of the genome that vary from individual to individual. <clears throat> 
So we compare our, our sequence from the fecal sample to our reference library. We identify the individual that that poop sample came from. We label the sample, and then, and then we know the individual whale that that sample came from. And then all of a sudden, all the data that we generate from that sample means so much more. It has so much more information tied to it because now it can be part of a time series from that particular whale. It can be part of a collection of samples from that particular pod or that particular season or year or geographic area. So one of the questions that we use, we try, have been able to address with genetic data from fecal samples is the question of paternity. So one of the really interesting things about southern resident killer whales, and I mentioned there are different types of killer whales um, in the Pacific Northwest, and some killer whales are called Biggs killer whales, sometimes they're called transient killer whales. Those are the ones that eat uh, marine mammals. And their social structure is a little bit different. They tend to move around a bit more. They tend to disperse from their mom when they grow up. The southern resident killer whales are really um, mama's boys. So nobody leaves home. Everybody stays home. So count yourself lucky if <laughs> you're not a killer whale mom um, or your kids would never be gone. But um, the killer whales born into the southern resident killer whales stay with their maternal group, their mom's family, for their entire life. And because of this, they don't disperse. Um, so we know who their moms are, so that's been really helpful. We've been able to construct a family tree of individuals born um, through multiple generations based on this information because when they're born, they stick with their mom, they nurse for a really long time, so they're really close to her and we're able to connect the dots there. But we don't know who the fathers are and understanding who the fathers are is an important piece of knowing like how closed is this population, how much gene flow is happening with other groups. And the reason we care about gene flow and, and mating patterns is because um, that helps us to understand how isolated this population is genetically. And that's an important piece determining um, the, the management of the population. So we've been able to use the genetic data to assign paternity. If we have samples from known fathers and we have a sample from a mother and her calf, then we can assign the father. And that's been really useful and provided some very key insights for the population. So that's one way we've used um, the fecal samples. But another important piece of um, when I talked about the threats, the three threats that were originally identified as being key for understanding why the population is declining. Um, and one of those was understanding what they're feeding on, what their key prey species are, so that we can support them kind of from the bottom up, so that we can understand what they need to survive. And, um, and that really is a challenge with whales. Whales spend very little time at the surface. We always see these pictures of killer whales at the surface or breaching their bodies out of the water. These are really underwater animals and they only come to the surface to breathe. So we don't get a lot of time to observe what they're doing underwater. And most of our clues to what they're feeding on come from stomach contents. So whenever a whale dies, of course, you know, that's challenging and, and it's very sad. Um, but we really try and maximize the amount of scientific information that we can get from that, that carcass. Um, so we can see what's in the stomach, and we can identify those stomach contents and, and see what they're feeding on. Sometimes they'll bring clues to the surface. This middle picture here is actually a picture of a transient or a Biggs killer whale. They're the ones that feed on marine mammals, and that's a huge chunk of gray whale um, that's draped across its head. So sometimes we'll see what they feed on. It's much easier with the Biggs killer whales because they're feeding on really large prey, and it, um, it's usually quite dramatic. Occasionally, the, I don't know if you can see the picture on the bottom there, that's a southern resident killer whale with a salmon draped across its rostrum, or part of its melon there, the, its uh, forehead. Um, and we do see that occasionally, but not very often. So we, if we're relying on these kinds of information, it gives us just these tiny little snapshots and not a lot to go on. So we started to leverage the information and the opportunity to collect fecal samples. 
And um, as, as Amanda mentioned, Roz Rolland um, pioneered work on fecal sample collection from right whales. Um, for my thesis work, I did a bunch of fecal sample collection from bottlenose dolphins, and then we applied that same technique, collecting fecal samples from the southern resident killer whales. And here you can see um, my colleagues out collecting fecal samples um, using one of those long-handled pool nets uh, off the coast of San Juan Island. So we collect these fecal samples, and each of the fecal samples um, has a whole bunch of little cells in it. And those tiny little cells are cells from the whale, they're bacteria, they're cells from prey. Um, and we actually use the DNA from all these cells. We can extract the DNA, um, as I mentioned earlier, and we can use a different approach. So we're not just sequencing the whale. Here we're actually using a marker that generates um, genetic sequence data for vertebrates. So we're getting all the fish, all the whales. We've actually designed the markers to try and reduce the amount of whale, because I, as you can imagine, there's a lot of whale DNA and whale poop. Um, but what we get out of that is information telling us which species are in there, which fish species are in there, as well as how much of each. So we get the relative amounts of all these different species, um, and that helps to construct a picture of what they're feeding on. So we, we've been doing this work for a while now and started collecting fecal samples in 2006. Um, I think there were maybe a couple collected in 2005, but it, it's been a while, and I must say our, our killer whale poop collection is, um, our freezers are bursting at the seams. Uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's an interesting collection. Um, and so when we started looking at this, we generated those sequence data from each of the fecal samples. And for this particular study, I think we had mostly samples from, from the summertime. So we were looking at midsummer and late summer diet. Um, and we had about 250 samples that we sequenced. And what we could see from that was that the diet changed seasonally. Um, and this was a really interesting, and it, it definitely kind of reflected the availability of different prey species. So the southern, I mentioned that the Biggs killer whales feed on marine mammals, whales and seals and porpoises and things like that. And the resident killer whales are the fish eaters. So they primarily pretty much exclusively eat fish, and out of the fish that they eat, they primarily eat salmon. And out of the salmon that they eat, let's see, in midsummer, it's about 95% Chinook. So they really have a very strong preference for Chinook. That does start to shift in late summer as coho becomes more available. And you do see, so if you imagine each of these pies is all the different sequence data, and then the section of the pie represents the different species. So you do see that there's a few other species that are represented in there. Um, but primarily they're feeding on Chinook and then coho later in the summer. And we keep trying to fill in the gaps. So we're constantly trying to fill in the gaps in our knowledge using new skills and new techniques and collecting additional samples. Because one thing we know about the whales is that protecting them and ensuring a healthy population and encouraging population growth, it, it doesn't end at the time of year um, when the samples are easiest to collect or when they're most accessible to us, which is during the summer, because they tend to spend a lot of time in the inshore waters around San Juan Island in the Puget Sound um, in the summertime. So we've really been putting a lot of effort in recent years into collecting samples further afield um, and, and also outside of the summer season. So this is a figure from the next uh, publication. And what you're looking at here is um, a collection. So they're stacked figures, one for each prey species that we identified. And then we have two different colored dots. And the open circles represent samples that were collected on the outer coast of Washington. And the closed circles are the ones um, in the Salish Sea, so around Puget Sound, Juan de Fuca, et cetera. And one of the interesting things is that as we expanded um, our collection season and our collection areas, we started to see a few more species trickling in, but we're still seeing that really dominant signal of Chinook salmon um, and then coho salmon popping up a bit later on. And you can see here, I kind of highlighted in green the winter samples, and that's where we were really trying to focus on filling in the gap to see, okay, well, what are they feeding on in the winter time? Um, 
And so you can see that we do have a few more species popping up. So I should mention within each species, the higher the dot, the more sequences we had. So that's a greater proportion of the sequences. Um, so you can see a few more species popping up. And then um, as we expanded our sampling range even further, last year we were out off of the outer Washington coast, um, I, uh, September, October, 2022, and for the first time, we detected sablefish uh, uh, in the fecal samples of killer whales. And so we know that out off the coast, when the salmon weren't very abundant, what are they feeding on at that time? So we're starting to get a little bit better picture of what they're feeding on at different times, and also in different years, because these patterns will change annually to some extent, depending on the relative availability and accessibility of different prey for them. Um, so this is a picture of a sable fish, which is also known as black cod. Um, some folks might be more familiar um, with it as black cod. Did someone just say delicious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have really good taste in fish. <laughs> and they really like the fatty fish. Like pink salmon swimming by, no thank you. But they'll go underneath the pink salmon and find themselves a Chinook. <laughs> They want bang for their buck too, right? Like if you're gonna expend all that energy, you want a lot of calories in. So, so here's another one of our, our handful of pictures where they're actually showing us what they're chasing and eating, where you can see a salmon. I think this was a coho um, up in front of the killer whale. So we're starting to piece together a little bit more information about what they're feeding on and expanding that to cover like more space and more time. Um, and this is really important, uh, particularly now, because in recent years we've been seeing a change and a shift in the um, presence of the southern resident killer whales around the inland waters. So they seem to be spending less time in the Salish Sea. Um, and that may be correlated with changes in the abundance of their favorite prey, which is probably Chinook. Um, and so if they're not finding Chinook there and they're not spending time there, they're going elsewhere to look for prey. So what are they feeding on out there? So we're really trying to tackle that and kind of that's the data gap that we're, we're looking at at the moment. So with the fecal samples, we can look at relative abundance of different prey. What are they eating? It probably represents a window of maybe 12 hours of gut transit time. Um, but there's only certain questions we can answer. So we can say which species are there. But sometimes we get lucky, and when they are feeding on a salmon, if we go into that area, um, when whales dive, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this, they leave this really calm, smooth patch of water behind them. It's called a fluke print, like a footprint, but a fluke print. Um, and, it's, and it's created by the upwelling of their flukes as they dive. Um, and some, if you go into that area after they're, they've moved on, sometimes you'll, well, sometimes you'll see poop, um, but sometimes you'll see uh, remnants of dinner. And so this is an example of a scale that was recovered and scooped out of the water with, with one of our nets. Um, and these tiny little scales also hold so much information. The challenge is that we don't find them as often as we do poop samples, which is why we focus on that. And the other thing is, if you're finding scales at the surface, those are generally from fish species that they're feeding on really close to the surface. Um, and so you're pretty much going to miss most of those deep um, species that they might feed on. Granted, they probably feed on them less, less often, like the halibut and sablefish and things like that. But when we do collect scales, it's really fun because we can look we can take that scale and extract DNA, and we can see not only what species it was from, we can see what age the fish was, and we can also take that fish and assign it to a particular stock or river. And that really helps us because that kind of granular, that detailed information lets, gives us a better idea of which stocks of salmon we need to protect and the, those are the ones that the killer whales are preferentially eating. Um, and so it gives us a bit more information for our, our conservation and management strategies. So the next step in our work with the fecal samples is to see if we can generate stock identification, stock information from the fecal samples in the same way that we do for the scale. And sometimes we get little chunks of, of tissue too. <clears throat> 
Um, and this is really challenging, though, because unlike a scale or a little bit of tissue, that only comes from one fish, right? So one scale came from one fish. But when you get a fecal sample, that contains a whole mixture of different species, different stocks, different meals. Um, and so technically, it presents challenges for us, um, but we're always up for a challenge. And so that's something that we've been working on the last couple years is to see whether or not we can get this kind of um, detailed data from the fecal samples as well, because as I mentioned, we have freezers and freezers full of poop. And so it, we are always looking for opportunities to maximize the use of that, that um, treasure trove. So beyond species. So what we do is we, we've been taking um, mock mixtures. So basically we take a little bit of DNA from a whole bunch of salmon and we try and emulate what it would be like in the gut of a killer whale. And we're like, okay, well, we know who all these salmon are and we'll mix it all up and see what comes out the other side in the same way that we're doing with the fecal samples. And then we extract all the DNA from them all together and then see if we can assign them to different stocks. And that's important because, as I mentioned, that it gives us information on which stocks we really need to focus management and recovery um, efforts on. And all those stocks, those Chinook stocks in particular, have different um, status, uh, different levels of production, and it helps us to know um, how to direct our efforts. Okay, so um, beyond what they're feeding on and who they are, this kind of like comes back to the whale side of things and away from the fish side of things, um, we can also use fecal samples as health indicators. Um, and one of the ways, we, I mentioned earlier all the different types of information we can get from fecal samples, whether it's from a, a human poop or wildlife poop or your dog's poop or whatever, you can get a lot of information. So one of the things we've been studying recently with some um, colleagues at Stanford University is looking at the gut microbiome. So what is the killer whale gut microbiome? How much does it change? What kind of information can we get from it? Because we know that the gut microbiome is tied to things like immune function and pathogen protection, um, digestion, assimilation of nutrients. Uh, hormones and all these kinds of things, those, those little microbes in your stomach are really key. So they're really important. Um, they, they tell us information, but they're also important in terms of how your body functions. And we know this from a lot of work on humans and model organisms. Um, there's also been some really cool work on uh, captive animals at um, zoos and other captive facilities where they've, they've developed um, methods for monitoring all the microbes in uh, poop of different animals um, so that they can track it over time and basically create like a health database, right? And they, they look for those signals where something might be um, different, uh, something might look um, like a disease or imbalanced. Um, and they can even use um, microbes as treatment for certain diseases. So they've, this is like a new and growing avenue, not just for humans. I mean, I feel like I've been hearing more and more about the gut microbiome in the news uh, over the last few years, but it's also increasing in uh, animal research and whale research. So what we've been doing, I know this looks like a really sciencey slide. Um, is we've been comparing the gut microbiome, so all the bacteria in the guts of killer whales from several different populations. The southern residents, um, they're like that bottom, I don't know, pinkish, reddish blob. Um, the blue one above that is the northern resident killer whales. And then if you look up towards the top, you can see that little gold colored circle. And that's, those are samples collected by some friends of ours up in Alaska. And one of the reasons this is important is because if we just look at one population in isolation, it doesn't really give us a frame of reference. Like, we don't have a textbook on what the killer whale gut microbiome should look like. Um, in humans, we have a pretty good sense of that already. We know which are good bacteria, which are bad bacteria, which are bacteria that probably came from your food or where you live. Um, but for whales, we don't really have that. So that's, we're kind of starting from the ground up and trying to build that picture. 
And so we looked and characterized the, the different types of microbes and how much of each one is in fecal samples um, from these three different killer whale populations. And we even looked at some of the killer whales from a captive population um, at two of the SeaWorld facilities to get a sense of how much does the, the bugs in your gut, right, the bacteria in your gut, how much does that change for one whale over time if we know what the health of that whale is. Because the animals at SeaWorld are, you know, they're really well managed, they have a constant diet, they're, they're constantly monitored, and so they know when a whale is off or when they're sick or they're being treated. Um, and so it gave us a really helpful frame of reference for that individual change over time. And so what this, this is a Venn, di Venn diagram. Um, it's basically a whole bunch of overlapping circles, and it shows you the ones that are different come, are shown in one color only. I can't remember where the dot is, but basically that 266 up at the top, that means 266 um, microbes, bacteria, are found only in the southern resident killer whales. And then if you look down at the bottom, there's 403 only in the Alaska. So basically, we're looking for the core. And that 59 in the middle, that's 59 different bacterial species that are found in all the killer whales we looked at. So that we can define as like the core microbiome. So that gives us a frame of reference for what we would expect from a killer whale probably in the Pacific Ocean. And then we can compare that to what we're seeing in the different populations to identify a population that might be showing symptoms of um, dis-ease or uh, dysbiosis on someone who's not very healthy. Um, and that's where we are with this. So the cool thing with the Southern Residents, because we've been collecting that archive of samples, we had hundreds of samples to choose from. Um, I think for this study, we ended up pulling in close to 500 different samples. And um, this, this picture is kind of fun. Um, it's just a list of the three different pods. So the southern resident killer whales have three different pods. They're family groups that are based around females, um, J, K, and L pod. And then we listed all the individuals down the side of those boxes that we had samples from. And then along the bottom there, that shows you the year. So you can see, for example, if you looked in the top right, L41, we have samples from L41 from almost every single year between 2006 and 2016. Um, and then L41 died in 2020. And these kinds of events, um, death, birth, um, successful calf, uh, these kinds of events, life events, are also really helpful because we can look at the samples collected around that time period and try and identify um, flags, red flags. So what we're looking for is can we use this information on all the bacteria in a killer whale's gut to identify flags that would be warning signs for us if we collected a fecal sample and we sequenced it and we identified those particular bacterial taxa, um, they could be a warning sign for us that that individual is in distress. We also see physical signs of distress, um, physical signs of emaciation and starvation, um, but usually by the time that we can see them, uh, then the animal is too far gone. Not always, sometimes they come back from it, but we're also looking for these other kinds of, we call them bioindicators or biomarkers. So um, this is kind of cool because it shows you for human disease how there are all these different factors that affect your gut microbiome and how your intestinal microbiome is connected with your metabolome, which is how your body is creating, metabolizing food and generating all these important um, amino acids and components that you need to make proteins to grow, to live, to thrive. And so our goal is to apply all these tools to the killer whale population and to the samples that we've been collecting from them to see if we can generate the same kind of health database and those kinds of biomarkers so that we can say, hey, this is an individual who's probably not doing well. We need to watch this individual carefully. We need to give them a little bit more space. Um, whatever it is that we can do within our power to manage the health of that individual in their environment. So 
you can see how all these different pieces are tied together. Um, the gut microbiome, and it links back to the health of the individual, the, how the identity of the individual tells us something about that individual, but it also tells us something about the population as a whole. And it's really, it's a big puzzle. Um, it's something that we have to just keep chipping away at, and we, we are able to leverage new scientific tools as they become available, which I think is an amazing opportunity. Um, and the other thing is that this is, this is like such a huge group effort. Um, there's so much that can be done and is being done to study the southern resident killer whales and to try and support their growth and recovery. Um, I think our current number is 74, 75, um, and that's pretty small for a large whale population. Um, and we really want to do our best to ensure that they're around for as long as possible and that they're thriving and not just surviving. And so understanding the health and the fitness, their needs, what it is that's affecting them, what are the things in their environment that we can control, um, that's a really important part of designing and contributing to our management and conservation approaches. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of insight into um, how the DNA in fecal samples is our golden ticket, why whale poop is the golden ticket, um, and how we're using them to study the diet, the health, um, and more of, of the southern resident killer whales. And now you know what whale poop looks like. And as I mentioned, this is a huge effort. Um, it's a really big collaboration. I know, do you like the pooping devil helix? That's really fun. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good figure. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to acknowledge some of our, our collaborators, postdocs, lab techs, field works, um, uh, friends, and, and colleagues. And I would be really happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I have so many questions. <laughs> that was fascinating. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll come around and uh, get to as many as of them as we can. But I'm going to start out with something we talked about beforehand. Killer whales, not orcas. <laughs> can you explain that? OK, sure. Um, so the, we call them killer whales, even though they are the largest member of the dolphin family. But technically, all dolphins are part of the toothed whale family odontocetes. Now, um, killer whales uh, have been called killer whales for a very long time because it originated as killers of whales. Uh, when the whalers saw them, uh, when uh, First Nations peoples saw them, they would often encounter big killer whales or transient killer whales, um, and those are the ones that feed on marine mammals like whales and seals and porpoises and things like that. And like I said, um, when they're killing a marine mammal, it's a very dramatic show. There's a lot of blood, there's a lot of chase. It's, um, it's very impressive. There's a lot of power. Um, and so they were called killers of whales and eventually got shortened to killer whales. And their Latin binomial name um, is Orsinus orca. And that basically means, you know, like demon of the sea that eats whales kind of thing. And um, so when you say orca, um, it's just kind of whale. That's, it just means whale. Um, but I think a, a lot of people started to make that switch from killer whales as a common name to orcas or orca whales because people didn't like the idea of calling them killers and they thought it was too mean. And um, I think some of that may have stemmed from the movement to try and go from killing whales and shooting at whales to supporting their conservation and management and, and recognizing them as an important part of the marine ecosystem. Um, and so it's, it's obviously a debatable question, but I think if you are being true to the species itself, they are killer whales. You said that um, the, the orcas are mostly deep divers, or they mostly are below the surface. Um, does the poop rise? In other words, it floats? That's such a good question, and we had the most hilarious conversation about that at a workshop I was at um, a couple months ago. So 
The, so all whales and dolphins, all cetaceans, um, they're basically aquatic animals that come to the surface only to breathe. So all their feeding, most of their socializing, all that happens at depth. In my observation, um, and I've spent a, an inordinate amount of time looking for whale poop and dolphin poop, um, they typically poop at the surface or within the top meter or so. And maybe it's because, you know, there's a lot of pressure underwater, so it's gotta be really hard. Um, but the, yeah, so when we collect it, it's floating at the surface and some of it does sink, uh, but some of it floats. And for killer whales in particular, um, they eat very lipid rich foods. There's a lot of fat in the sablefish, in the Chinook, and I think that really helps it to float, which does us a favor too, because it makes it easier to, to scoop up. Yes, I have two questions. Um, the first one's probably really simple for you, and that is, I'm not familiar with the Puget Sound area. Are there other whales besides the killer whales in the Puget Sound area? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We do, we actually have quite a few different species. Um, in, in the larger Salish Sea, so Puget Sound is the kind of the inland waters that go from just north of Seattle all the way down to Tacoma. And then beyond that, there's like the San Juan Islands, um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, uh, Southern Victoria, uh, Southern Vancouver Island around Victoria. And we refer to that whole area as the Salish Sea. Um, and in the Salish Sea, we have a two different species of porpoise. We have harbor porpoise and doll's porpoise. Um, we have killer whales, several different kinds of killer whales, different flavors. We have gray whales, humpback whales, minke whales, um, and occasionally you'll see some, something else wandering in. But those are, those are kind of like the um, primary suspects. Now, my second question is, um is there a specific time of year when it's easier to see the whales for those of us that would love to see something like that jumping out of the water? Yeah, um, whale watching is huge in the Salish Sea uh, around Seattle, the San Juan Islands, Victoria, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, it's huge in the Salish Sea in the summertime. Um, traditionally, that's when the whales would come into the Salish Sea. They spend a lot more time in the winter on the outer coast, and they're basically following their prey. So in the, in the summertime is when all the Chinook and the other th salmon species start coming in towards the rivers, because then they're going to go up the rivers to spawn. And, um, and the, the killer whales are just following them. Uh, and so we would typically see them in the Salish Sea between kind of May and September. So that's your primary whale watching season. Um, but having said that, the amount of time they spend in the Salish Sea varies uh, from year to year, depending on what the Chinook are doing. Um, and I will say, if you're going to go out whale watching, the, there's a couple of great tips. One is shore-based whale watching. Um, off of San Juan Island, there's a really cool lighthouse park there called Lime Kiln Park. Um, and it's an awesome place to see the southern residents because they tend to go right up the shore there. Um, and also, uh, going out with a certified whale watching company is the best way to see them. One, because they know where to go, they know where to find other species, um, and they usually have a certified and trained naturalist on board to help provide all kinds of fun facts and information. Um, and they will also be up on all the latest guidelines and rules around uh, wildlife watching and spend, giving space to the southern residents and things like that, um, but yeah. Hi. Hi. First off, best poop talk ever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is, was it your first? I'm not going to say. Uh, three questions, and you can cut me off whenever you want. First, what happened? Beer failure? Okay. First question, poop question. Okay. I'm surprised how much... It, it surprised me that you were able to extract that much DNA from poop and that it wasn't all destroyed in the, in the digestion process. How much of it is that may be hiding things that we don't know? Mm, that's a great question. So um, what we do is we target, so we can actually get a ton of DNA 
The problem is that when you extract DNA from the poop, you get whale, you yeah. get bacteria, you get pathogens, and you that, get fish. That was going to be my next question. How do you sort it all out? Well, uh, yeah, so that's why we have clever little bioinformatic ways to separate out all our sequences. Um, so we, we generate, we use the assay that we use, targets a particular part, this is going to get techy, okay. of the mitochondrial genome. Yeah. And so there's more mitochondria per cell than there are nuclei, uh -huh. so that helps us. Um, and we're looking at a tiny piece of it. So the mitochondrial genome is like 16,000 base pairs. We're looking at 300. And so even if the DNA is digested and degraded, um, we can usually pretty reliably amplify that 300 base pair section. Mm -hmm. It is possible that some of it is going to be um, more digested and degraded than others, but that shouldn't be species specific, but it might be meal specific, right. right? So that's why I say the window of time that we're probably looking at is like the, their last meals in 12 hours. Um, because anything beyond that, that was probably still lingering in the GI tract and making its way through, uh, is probably a lot more degraded. Right. Yeah. Okay, next question. You had an awesome slide about diet. I am certain that you have compared the data that you've gotten about what they're eating to what is actually available in the environment at the time. Question is, are they, is there a large amount of options and are they being very choosy or are they eating just what's available? Um, both. So there, we, we have looked at that and, um, and it's a really fun thing to like look at the patterns of relative prey abundance of the different salmon species given like the time, the location, the year, um, because we do see huge fluctuations year to year, particularly in terms of like Chinook returns because these guys are feeding on the returns coming back to their natal streams. Um, and so, yeah, we, we see them, they're targeting species that are in the area and if those aren't in the area, I think they're going elsewhere. And this is probably why we're starting to see this kind of spatial shift. Um, and then what was the other thing I was gonna say? So, oh, but like the pink salmon. So in, we know that pink salmon in the Pacific Northwest run hot in odd years. Um, even years, there's, they're not really a thing anymore down here. Um, but in those odd years, even if the pink returns are huge, I've never detected pink salmon in their feces. Um, and even when we've been able to see pink salmon from the boat, and then they collect a poop sample, and, and they're like, oh, Kim, this, this, one's, this one's the pink salmon poop. Um, there's no pink salmon. So they are being very choosy. So they're being very choosy. And we know there's been some really cool work done um, looking at their echolocation abilities, and they can actually distinguish between the density, size and density of different prey yeah. items. So I think distinguishing between a low-fat mm -hmm. fish and a high-fat fish is like easy peasy okay. for them. Last one, quick. We have pods and families that only have 75 individuals or 100 individuals. Is that enough genetic diversity to keep that going? So we have um, a paper that's about to come out in the next couple of weeks where we've been looking at inbreeding and um, genetic diversity in the population. And we know that we have a couple of cases of uh, inbreeding in the southern resident killer whales where it was a mother-son mating. Um, and one was a father-daughter, I believe. And, uh, but that's only two out of all the paternities that we have assigned, which is, is pretty small, which also suggests that they have some way of sorting and mate selection. Um, you know, they're not just mating randomly. Um, the also, another interesting thing from that is that when we did that first study, uh, we saw, you know, we said, okay, well, we've got eight, I think it was, males of reproductive age in the population at the time, and 95% of the offspring assigned to three of the males, and they were all the biggest, oldest males. And so those young males, they just hadn't come into their own yet. Um, they were smaller, less experienced. The older males were around. I don't know. So there's definitely some mate selection happening. Um, but what we are seeing is that 
the southern resident killer whales do not have a huge amount of genetic diversity in the population. And we know that that's really important in a wildlife population to allow them to adapt to changes over time. And so that is a concern. Um, and it's not something that we can manage, but we can control or we can manage other pieces of their life. So our goals are to really focus on the pieces that we can manage um, in order to support all the other factors in their life. Um, because the inbreeding and the low genetic diversity is just one piece of the puzzle. Um, but yes, they do have uh, considerably less genetic diversity than we see in other populations, and that may be playing a factor in, um, in how the population is doing, how long individuals are living, and how many calves females are having uh, in their lifetime. I'm wondering about, well, first climate change, and also the effect of all these tourist boats on, the, on their communication skills. So um, climate change is a big one, and I think that that comes back to their prey base for sure. Um, as far as the tourist boats, there's been some really interesting data collected and published looking at the changes in behavior of the whales when there are boats around and when there are not boats around. Um, we can put these... We can put these we can put these suction cup tags on the whales that record where they are and how deep they dive and how many fish they catch. And, um, and, and then they release and we're able to collect the data. And uh, it's, it's been really helpful because what we've been able to see is that when there are a lot of boats around and they're really close, the whales tend to catch less fish. And they also tend to have to speak louder like if you're in a really noisy room, and all those things require more energy. So if you have to work harder for your prey and you have to speak louder to stay in touch with your family and you have to um, echolocate more frequently to find your fish, then it requires more energy and that requires more prey. And so that's why the regulations around the um, whale watching industry and, and private boats in, around killer whales, that's why that keeps changing. And it, and it kind of adapts when new information is at hand. So the new regulations that require a thousand yards distance is um, an upgrade from past regulations. And, and so that's kind of how we're, we're doing, dealing with that new information and, um, and adapting to it. Thank you for your presentation. So how much of the human genome um, you know, is shared with the whale genome? And what insights do we have around, particularly around lipid metabolism, given the preponderance of the fatty diet, especially you know, gallbladder function or bile and things of that nature? Um, that we have learned. Any surprises that for you from all this work that you've done that is like, oh, that, that's a complete surprise that you can talk about? Yeah, so um, there will be some genes that are common across mammals, and we will share those genes. And so those are functional parts of the genome, and so those are like housekeeping genes and, and genes that are required to produce energy by your cells and things like that, and those will be common and conserved. Um, and we tend to avoid those regions when we're, when we're looking at the genome from an adaptation perspective and also from a like, what species is it? Because what we need are the pieces of the genome that vary from species to species so that we can have our kind of reference library with a sequence for each species and then match them up. So we're kind of looking at what some people call junk DNA um, because it doesn't code for anything particularly. Um, and those are really useful features for us when we're trying to look at species or stock or individual identity. And as for the lipid part of it, um, the gut microbiome, so the second phase of that study is actually a collaborative 
study um, that we're just starting with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. Um, and we analyzed a bunch of their samples from both the southern residents and the northern residents um, for the gut microbiome. So we characterized all the bacteria in those samples, and they're looking at the metabolomics. And then we're going to mesh the data between the metabolomics and the gut microbiome, along with data on contaminants, uh, toxic pollutants and things like that, which we can also get at from the fecal samples. And so I think that that's going to be really illuminating. And even the, um, I had a little, I had a, a meeting uh, a month or so ago with our colleagues up there and they gave us a little data teaser. Um, and some of their preliminary data are really interesting. And we're already, with a really limited sample size, we're already seeing some pretty dramatic differences between the southern residents and the northern residents. And so hopefully when we increase that sample size so we can kind of capture all the variability that's there, It'll help us to hone in on which, what those functional differences are between the two populations. And then we can look at the diet differences between the two populations and the environmental differences and, get a, and try and piece together that big picture and see where are they the same, where are they different, and where might those, those interactions be happening. Yeah. OK, we're going to get to just a couple more questions. Thank you for the talk. Um, so actually, just expanding on that, so have you uh, looked at like whole genome sequencing on all these samples? Because you're looking at SNPs, which is just like little snapshots. And if that's true, could you, if you were able to do that, or if you are doing that, are you asking questions about some of the genetic exchange between these different pods? I'm interested, like historically, you know, 500 years ago, were these really these small populations or were they all spread out? And how much genetic exchange? And then my last question is kind of from that is, is just from a pathogen standpoint. Um, you know, have you looked at, um, I guess, good and bad pathogens? I mean, there's good organisms in, in there, but there's also pathogens. And, and how, what kind of exchange is there between land-based populations, um, to, uh, say, with uh, you know, toxoplasmosis and things like that in these whale populations? Um, so I'm going to start with the last question first. Um, so the, in terms of like pathogenicity and things like that, we're really borrowing information that we have because a lot of these taxa, um, bacterial taxa, have been previously described in other uh, terrestrial populations, marine populations, humans, et cetera. And so we're borrowing information from those to help identify when we have outlier taxa, taxa that are either really high in the southern residents or really low compared to other populations or, or it, one individual compared to another. We can look at those particular taxa and see how they compare where they've been found elsewhere and what their kind of uh, potential pathogenicity is. Um, we've also started doing some uh, metagenomics on particular taxa of interest, which will help to get at that kind of the functional piece of it. Um, uh, whole genome seeks. So yes, we have actually, so the fecal samples are not great for whole genome sequencing just because um, it's pretty degraded and there's, it's such a mixture. Um, but we do have those biopsy samples that have created our reference library for individuals. And for the inbreeding study that I mentioned, um, that was actually based on whole genome sequences of 102 southern resident killer whales. So that's all of the living killer whales except for some of the very young calves uh, who are like five years and under, um, as well as uh, several that have died already since the start of the study. And we had uh, 50 animals from Alaska population as well for comparison. And then the next phase of that study, which we're kind of like a third of the way into, um, is doing whole genome sequencing on the northern resident killer whales so that we can have this direct comparison comparison. And, um, and it, it's been super illuminating. It's, it's really interesting. It's a lot of data to wade through. Um, but it's, it's really helpful to have that, that complete sequence. Here in the back, you mentioned that you're tackling all of this from a conservation lens. Is there anything that we could and should be doing to help these populations? Um, so yeah. Uh, from the, I think the best thing that we can do is focus on um, 
the, the big picture and the things that we can change or control are the anthropogenic effects, right? So we can control how, what we're doing to the environment. Um, we can control the, some of the legislation that goes into the toxic contaminants and wastewater treatment and um, industrial effluent. And some of that, uh, a lot of that kind of like goes back to um, politics and policy. And that's probably the best way and the, and the way that you can, can um, vote with your beliefs. Um, because those, those are the kinds of things that actually have the largest effect. Um, when you're talking about like the marine environment as a whole. Hi. Um, so my question is Venn diagram related. So I love a good Venn diagram, but I was really interested, that is loud. Um, I was really interested in the fact that like the Alaska and the Southern, they share so much of their microbiome, but then even the Northern and Southern, uh, like very little, is there, any kind of reasoning you guys have for like why the Alaska would have so much in common with the Southern? Um, that's a good question. Uh, some of that comes down to the core microbiome and, um, and the non-pathogenic taxa. And so those good taxa we would expect to be shared more frequently between the two. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head why we would see uh, more similarity between Alaska and Southern versus Northern and Southern, except that we have a much larger sample size for the Alaska killer whales, so some of that may come into play there because the Northern residents were represented, one, by a smaller sample size and by fewer years, and so I think that does kind of skew things a little bit. I have one short question. How long do they live? Um, so the killer whales live to be up to 80 years for a female and maybe 50 years for a male. Um, they, have, they have life cycles and life stages and, and lifespans that are pretty similar to humans. Um, females typically give birth to their first calf anywhere between 11 and 13 years old. And males are you know, sexually and physically mature by the age of 15. Um, which is another thing that, that does tend to make them quite vulnerable because these are really long-lived species that have um, pretty long periods of time between calves. So females typically calve once every five years. And so that's, that's not very many calves when uh, females reproduce between the ages of about 12 and 40. Um, and then after 40, 43, something like that, um, the females are no longer uh, reproductive. And for our final question, though, if you have questions, you're welcome to come up after. What one takeaway item would you want our audience to walk out of here with from your talk? Um, I think that's a tough one. One, science is really cool and poop is really cool. Um, and, and the second thing I think is that, you know, I, I hope that I impressed upon you, one, some of the amazing ways that we're able to study these these wildlife populations, but also I, you know, just highlighting the fact that these are really important and critical piece of the marine ecosystem and they're also very much a sentinel species. You know, they're, they're high on the food chain, they're eating things that we eat, they're living in local waters, and they're something that we can monitor as an indicator of the health of our marine environment and I think that's, that's really important. Okay, well with that, let's say thank you to our speaker, Dr. Kim Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. And thank you to all of you for coming this evening. If you got six or better on the trivia, come up and grab a pint glass. If you have more questions, please feel free to come up here and chat. And come see us next Sunday at the Alberta Rose Theater if you want to learn about geology and wine. Thank you. Have a fabulous evening.